So, moms, they handle band-aids and boo-boos, right? They handle snotty noses and heartaches. Moms, they, they help us endure storms and power outages, proms and penicillin, restrictions and permissions. Moms do it all. Moms are a physical reminder that we're going to be okay and that we're loved and we're cared for and we're cherished. They are educator, informer, instructor, hugger, holder, and they make a house a home. Did you know that mothers show us the love of God the Father? And you know how I know? Because of my mama's purse. It has everything in it. As a child, I distinctly remember Mama carrying around this suitcase-sized purse, this pocketbook with no end. It had hairbrushes, it had candy, it had stamps, it had tweezers, it had Tylenol, it had trash bags, it even had a change of underwear for me. Walmart got its business model from my mom with a supersized pocketbook. Maybe you're like me and you remember Mama's purse and all the things, all the wonders it held. What is the wildest, craziest, most insane thing that your mama carried in her purse that you remember? What was it? Do you remember? I remember mama would give me her purse if I'm looking for change, and you have to dig all the way to the bottom and get under the the, the heavy fold in the very bottom and and, and dig out all the final little coins if we're going to go in and get get a treat at the store. I remember... Mama, pass me your purse in church, just hoping that I'd find something there to pacify myself while I was in big church. And I see some of y'all do that in the mornings, too. You pass along. But it's a lot easier now because in that purse, you also have things like iPads and iPhones and i stuff. And, 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 but there's Mama's purse is a, is, a, is a miracle of God, is it not? It's, it's given to those angelic beings we call moms that allow us to truly see and perceive the love of God. From tissue to, to, to a toothbrush, from gum to needle and thread, from crayons to iPads, Mom's purse truly is that miracle that allows us to see and glimpse and feel God's love. A few moments ago, I, I read a, a passage of Scripture as we committed with these parents and these children. A few moments ago, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'd invite you to, to open up your Bibles this morning, turn your, your, your iPads and things on this morning, to, to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and follow along. I believe it's in your bulletins this morning as well. And have a pen handy too because I, I think there's some things that you're going to want to write down and want to mark up this morning. As we open up Deuteronomy chapter 6 and we're going to begin in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these things that I command you today shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You will bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I believe God's word is clear as to the role and the response of someone who worships God. That role and response comes out of the overflow of love in their lives for children, but especially for God. Now, whether you're a mom or not, I believe that there are principles here today that are listed out in this job in Deuteronomy 6 that extend to all of us, church. Moms, dads, cousins, aunts, uncles, teachers, leaders, church. We have a role to play. We are to reflect God. Whether you're a guardian or a caregiver or a coach or a pastor or some other leader, maybe you're a grandparent, we have a shared responsibility. And I don't say this to to water down motherhood in in any way. I would never do that because I would be beaten within an inch of my life. I would not escape this place in that regards. But rather to draw in as many of you this morning as will listen to this passage. Because it's not just about mom. It's not just about dad. For that matter, it's really about God. It's not about us, it's about God. And then it talks about how we have a responsibility as we love God to the coming generation, the generation that's coming after us. There's a civic and moral and spiritual responsibility that's conveyed in this passage of Scripture. Notice the words in Deuteronomy 6 with with your pens, guys. 
I want you to circle some things as we walk through. Love. You see that word love? Circle that word love because that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. And it's love with everything that you have. Heart, mind, soul, strength. Everything. Scripture tells us to, that we're writing these words on our hearts. And then the next thing you see is to teach those words. To teach. You have a role and responsibility to, to love God and then to, to love and learn those words of God, but then to teach them and teach them with diligence. Circle that word diligence. Circle it up. Great persistence is what diligence means. You're to do it always. Always. And then next it talks about how you're to talk with your children. I know that's a novel concept in the world today, but we're to talk with our kids. We're to talk to them all the time about the things of God. And then verse 8, verse 8 is a, a really interesting verse to me because it talks about binding things. Binding things by setting example. In, in, in Jewish culture, they would, they would bind these, these tablets, these books, to their very foreheads. They would strap them up to remind them of God's truth and God's love and God's commands. They would strap, that's why it says, to the, to the, to the front, they should be as uh, frontlets. They would write things on their, on their hands. Some of y'all write things on your hands to remind yourself of stuff. Kind of the same idea, but it's kind of a more permanent thing. It's part of your dress for the day. You write those things on your hands. You strap them to your foreheads. And, and it's not just for your sake. It's for the sakes of the people around you because they see you living out the principles and truths of God's Word. It goes on to, to see there how, how we're to, to teach and talk when we sit in our house and when we walk by the way and when we lie down and when we rise up. We're to bind the words of God to our hands and to our head. And we're to write them in the doorposts of our houses and on the gateposts as we go out. So in essence, the, 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 the job that we're talking about here, this, this idea here, we're, we're to live out God's truth everywhere we go, anytime we go there. We, we have them as we leave our house because they're in the, in the doorpost. We see them when we come back in our house because they're on the doorpost. We see them as we leave the yard because they're on the gatepost. And when we come back in the yard because they're on the gatepost. We see them on our hands because they're on our hands. And we see them on our heads, especially when we look in a mirror, because it's strapped to our heads. Now that may seem a little ridiculous or redundant, kind of like overkill. But that's what God wants us to understand. How important it is. This is what it really looks like when you have truly written God's Word on your heart. It manifests itself out in the real world. God's love is for us. And it is exhibited so often by the people that do care for us and love us. As a God worshiper, as a Christ follower, as a hope believer, as a grace receiver, as a Jesus lover, as a world changer, church, we are and can be the example that's laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 6, but only in a response to the love that we found through Jesus Christ. You see, I believe this passage is about mothering. I think mothering is, is so much bigger than the physical act of becoming a mother. This teaches us several things. And the first one is to love God. Verse 5 says, You will love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You're to love God. The second thing is you were to teach the words of God. Teach the words of God. Verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And we're to illustrate love always. Illustrate love always. Verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house Three things that I think we can understand about moms, understand about mothering, and they're laid out right here. Love God, teach the words of God, illustrate love always. Because mothering, mothering reflects God. Mothering reflects God's love. Mothering reflects who God is in a very real, very tangible way. This past week, and just trying to, to think through and prepare for this morning, uh, I simply asked a question on, on, on my Facebook thing this week and had several of you and, and friends of mine that responded, what is the best thing? What is the best thing about moms? And, and the number one answer overwhelmingly was, was unconditional love. Unconditional love. There are other, other little phrases that were thrown in there 
there, there are things about um, how mom was with you always. And, and that was written by my dad, who, whose mom passed away about 15 years ago. But, but moms are, are with you always. The things that they say, the things that they're always with you. So another answer was they add love to everything. And I, I think this is Becky because she said moms even add love to turkey sandwiches. best things about mom is her cooking. best things about mom is their sacrifice for their kids. Think about your mom and the sacrifices that, that she made for you. Think about your mom and the sacrifices she made for you that you don't even know about. Um, one person uh, talked about how one of the best things about moms is they don't take themselves too seriously. And that way they don't always take everything so seriously. They can add humor and spice to life. Another answer was best things about mom is the ability to listen and to love, no matter what the circumstances are. I truly hope that you've had someone in your life that has been like that. Maybe it was, was your genetic mother. Maybe it was a, a, a mother figure in your life. Maybe it was, was a coach or a friend. Maybe it's someone today that's, that's here with you. Maybe you've never really had a person like this in your life, someone who constantly reflected God. But I can promise you this, mothering is a concept that I think we should all embrace, whether we're female or not. Mothering reflects God. I found this story that I want to read to you this morning. Um, it, it's found in Guidepost, and Guidepost is this little magazine that comes out that has all sorts of really great and wonderful devotions. So um, I want you to bear with me as I read this account. It's a lady named Elizabeth Kelly who lives in, uh, in New Hampshire, and she... She is uh, going to tell her story as I relate this story to you this morning. New Hampshire was where I'd spent most of my life and where things had fallen apart. My marriage had dissolved. I'd lost my job in my home. I'd come to Florida thinking maybe I could start over. But here I was, camped out with my kids at a friend's place. The only work I could find was part-time. I was 42 years old and had no way to support my family, no home, nowhere I really belonged. I'd make a, made a mess of pretty much every opportunity I'd ever been given. And maybe I didn't deserve another chance. Maybe there really was no hope for me. Then Meredith called from New Hampshire. Elizabeth, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but your Graham's in a bit of a fix. I caught my breath. Meredith was, was the daughter-in-law of Minerva Beale, the woman who'd taken me into her Manchester, New Hampshire group home when I was an infant and basically raised me. She was the woman I called Graham. The one constant in my crazy life. She'd recently had heart surgery, and I'd visited her just before I left for Florida. Are you still looking for work, Meredith asked. Before I could answer, she said, because Graham's caregiver's moving away, and we could really use you up here. You and your kids could live in Graham's house. I would felt like I'd been whiplashed, anxious for Graham, stunned at the sudden lifeline. I needed to run by the kids first, I said, but I knew inside. My birth mom, unmarried when she had me, frankly admitted she couldn't care for me or my two older sisters when she dropped me off at Graham's group home. Boyston Home for Girls. Graham and her husband, Earl, Grampy to me, he was a minister, were my real parents. Even after they retired from the group home, several, seven years later, my sisters and I went to, went to live with my father. Whenever my dad's depression got bad, he'd leave us with the Beals house in Londonbury. Graham still lived there. That house with its simple antique furnishings and wall hangings stitched with scripture verses had always, always been a refuge for me. Two days after Meredith phoned, my kids and I were on a plane to New Hampshire. Oh, Elizabeth, it's wonderful to see you, Graham exclaimed when I arrived. No tisking at the mess I've made in my life. No embarrassment at being, at being taken care of. Just smiles, hugs, and kisses. Especially for my son and my daughter, 15-year-old Michael and 4-year-old Sabone. The house, the house had four bedrooms and there was space for everybody. Graham said, you should sleep in your old room. And after settling in, I walked in the room and there was my twin bed with the wood headboard and the small bookshelf. I swallowed hard to keep from crying. The old piece still inhabited this room, but I couldn't help wondering whether I'd somehow put myself beyond its reach. I'd taken so many wrong turns since those childhood days. Memories flooded in. Grampy striding purposely through the house, whistling some hymn, Graham playing checkers with my sisters and me, serving up vanilla ice cream after dinner was made with real vanilla beans. 
I especially love the way Scripture wove so effortlessly through Graham's everyday conversation. Usually kids made fun of that kind of piety, but I never did. How could I when her faith so plainly infused her whole life? She and Grampy, they could have let my sisters go. They should have kicked us out of the, the group home as soon as we arrived. The other children, they, they were wards of the state, but, but my parents were technically on the hook for us, to pay for us, but they never did. The Holmes Board of Directors encouraged the Bills to turn us out. Grampy refused, saying he'd quit before he'd let any such thing happen. Instead, he took on extra jobs to, keep, to afford our upkeep. Love is for keeps, Graham liked to say, her voice strong and vital as she was. You know, it's hard seeing her weak now. She often used a wheelchair. I was at her side from dawn until bedtime. I cooked, I cleaned, I got her dressed, I brushed her hair. Most of the days were spent in an old easy chair in the living room. There we read aloud. She loved the devotional time. We'd sing and talk about old times. She said, you're such a thoughtful girl. There was lots of turmoil in your life, but whenever you were here, you were such a joy. Really, I thought. I couldn't stop thinking about all the times that I'd tested the Beals' generosity. When I was 12, my mother suddenly reemerged and took me to live with her. Three years later, I ran away. I was wild. Two years after that, I dumped an abusive husband. I got, and I called the Beals to collect. They said, come home. That was what they always said. When I got pregnant at age 20, that's what they said. When my second marriage to the father of that child crumbled many years later, that's what they said. And even now, at the end of another dead end, come home. Why, I wonder. Did Graham ever seem to judge me? Why was her door always open, her peace ready to be shared? What had I done to deserve that? One evening, we sat talking in the living room. My self-recrimination must have been especially evident. Elizabeth, said Graham softly, remember what I told you long ago, that I come from a broken home too? And believe me, if you think divorce these days is difficult, it was even worse back when my parents did it. I spent a lot of time alone as a child. That's when I learned to seek Jesus' companionship. Call on him, Elizabeth. He'll never abandon you. I wanted to believe that. But of course, God loved Graham. And she was so good. The days turned to weeks, and Graham gradually declined. Four months after I'd arrived, she was put on hospice care. Christmas time approached. Often the house was dark and silent when I put Graham to bed. One night I wheeled her into a room and got her settled. Let's read our devotional, she said. And I opened the devotional and read the day's scripture from Zephaniah. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Graham lay against her pillows, contemplating these words. Finally, she asked me to turn out the light so we could pray. Graham's prayers were formal and old-fashioned, full of these and vows. Our Heavenly Father, she began, her voice a little more tremulous than usual. We thank thee. We know that thou art available, Lord, willing to hear us if we call upon thee. Let us be faithful in calling, receiving thy answers, and in letting thee speak to us according to thy will. We thank thee for all the good things that come from thy hand. In Jesus' name, amen. And the room was silent. I heard her wavering breath. She'd fallen asleep. For a moment I sat still, not wanting to make noise creaking across the floor. Suddenly I remembered another dark night, years before in the group home. It was one of my earliest memories. I was a toddler cradled in Graham's lap late at night. For some reason I hadn't been able to sleep and she'd come in to comfort me. I looked up to her and saw, shining in the gloom, streaks of tears down Graham's face. Why are you crying, Graham? I asked. Oh, Elizabeth, she sighed. I am tired, dear. But I will stay up with you. And she began to sing the lullaby. Now I was the one tired sitting in the dark. And in a rush it came to me what had enabled Graham to love me all these years without stinting and without judgment. It wasn't some kind of spiritual heroism. It was that moment in her own childhood when she called out to Jesus and then sought his companionship ever after. Graham's love was a gift of faith. It was God loving through her, God loving me. I had thought that I was unlovable, especially by God. Here was Graham proving me wrong. Here I was proving myself wrong. I was taking care of Graham. I was returning that unstinting love. 
Graham was right. Love is diffuse. Finally, I got up and quietly slipped out of the room, shutting the door behind me. The next morning, I went to Graham's room to wake her, and I pushed open the door and was surprised to see her sitting in her chair. Her chin rested on her chest. Her body was slightly slumped. And it took me a moment to realize that she had somehow gotten up in the middle of the night, sat in her chair, and passed away. I didn't cry, not then anyway. I knew God was rejoicing over her. She was resting in his love. And at last, I was too. Graham's faith is like the faith of many of our moms, many of our surrogate moms, and many of us. It's an opportunity that we have to share with others. Love is for keeps. Love is for keeps. Love is for real. Mothering, whether you're a mother or not, truly reflects God's love. It was modeled out in the life of this grandmother, this, this, this foster grandmother at that. It was modeled love is for keeps and I want to ask you this morning to make that level of commitment to living out a life that shows love is for keeps love like this for someone else love like this because it means the world to them love like this because it makes a difference maybe between when they accept who Jesus is and the truth of his love or not this morning church I ask you to make a commitment. To make a commitment to love God, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of others. Not just to teach the words of God, His commands, His plans, His mission, His Son, but to teach it for others. To illustrate love always, not sometimes. Not when it's beneficial to yourselves. Not when you feel like it. Not when someone else deserves it. But always. What's the best thing about mom? Time and time again, the answer her unconditional love. Modeling God. Reflecting God. Loving even when not loved back. Even when not appreciated in the moment. Loving no matter what. Loving without regard to circumstance. Loving because loving is what you do. It is who you are. We need to be mothered. And we need to mother others. Because God loves us so much. God wants you to experience his love, his love for keeps. He wants you to understand and know his unconditional love. And for that, you need to know his son, Jesus Christ. This morning, that is the invitation for those of us that are here today that have never accepted the free gift that is Jesus Christ, to accept in faith who he is and what he's done. And for those of us that have made that commitment and crossed that line of faith, our challenge, our encouragement is to live out our lives with this admonition to love God, to teach others the words of God, and to illustrate that love always. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we come to you this morning humbly. We come to you this morning seeking you in your word and your truth. God, we come today celebrating the magnificence of your plan. God, we thank you that you send mothers to illustrate your love to us. And God, we thank you that we have the possibility, the capacity even, to express that to other people. God, that we get to live out the truth of who you are each and every day. Father, this morning, for that one, for that family, for that son or that daughter, for that husband, that wife, for that grandparent, that mom or dad, God, for that one that needs a special touch from you today, a special reminder today, God, I pray that you give them that. Just in these few moments, God, remind them of your greatness. Remind them of an instance from, from childhood where, where mom stepped in. Remind them of a time when you showed up. Maybe you used a mother's love to express your and God, give us the courage to, to be that instrument in your hands, to mother someone else, our own children, or another, or a friend. Father, today, for that one that's never experienced your unconditional love, Father, I pray.
pray salvation in that life. That they accept you and they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. God, the commitment that we make today lasts a lifetime. Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for mothers. We thank you for mothering. We thank you for the examples they set. It's in his name that we pray.